Let's discuss the call flow with hotspots, also known as Whisper. Now I'm sure everybody's been in a venue where they offer free or even fee-based wireless connectivity services, but two problems really become present when we introduce this. First, we need to have a way to authenticate, and second, we need to have a way to perform accounting on the clients and, and kind of the underlying connectivity and issues that are going on inside of there. Well, in 2003, the Wi-Fi Alliance got together and they created a proposal for what they coined Wireless Internet Service Provider Roaming, or what we now know as the acronym WHISPER. The proposal really suggested a combined mechanism that includes the wireless access point, a web browser, an HTTP server, and a radius server. Now the key points with this is you have some pieces of this that the venue own and control, and then some of it that the client owns and controls, but they're all pretty common across the board. For example, the client's ownership piece of this is the web browser. The wireless access point, the web server, and the radius server, those are all venue owned and controlled. So the result of this was a mechanism that we named Universal Access Method, and this really allows users to access these hotspots using nothing more than a web browser. Now, one of the biggest advantages of this is there's no pre-configuration on the client device or any pre-installed software that's required. This really kind of opens it up and allows people to connect ad hoc and freely in all of these different venues. Okay, so let's talk about the functionality of what's happening when you connect to a hotspot, how you authenticate, what the details are behind it. So let's look at that. So we've all sat down and probably connected in a coffee shop or any type of venue. When you do, you find the hotspot SSID or WLAN wireless network name. You hit that from your smartphone or your laptop. Once you've done that, the user's device, your client device, your phone, your laptop, it's going to be assigned an IP address and DNS servers, and this is typically done via DHCP. And keep in mind, a static IP address will prevent you from receiving an IP address, so DHCP is required. Now, one key with this is hotspots utilize layer three authentication. That means you have to have an IP address to be able to communicate with any of these outlying servers and services that are running within this environment. So the user is going to remain unauthenticated, but he's going to be allowed access to some predefined ports. And these ports are crucial because this is what you need to actually get access and authenticate within this venue before you can then communicate out to the internet. So the user is allowed access to these ports, but keep in mind, they're only allowed access to these ports within the venue. You're still not allowed access to these ports outside of the venue or to the internet. But you're going to get things like DHCP, DNS for resolution and lookups, HTTP, HTTPS, and then destinations configured under the walled garden. But when we talk about walled garden, a great way to think about that is think about cloud path. Okay, now typically what happens is the client's device is going to pop a browser window up. And when this happens, you can continue, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So what you need to do is open a browser and manually navigate to a website of your choosing. For this, we're going to use Ruckus Networks as an example, and I'm doing this for a reason. If you'll note, we're talking about an HTTPS site. Well, sometimes HTTPS will cause issues, so you need to go to a known non-HTTPS or just a normal HTTP site. A great site for this, and it sounds funny at first, but it's example.com. This website is clean HTTP, and you can get to it without any of the HTTPS concerns. So once we navigate to that URL, a DNS request for the URL is sent and resolved via DNS. Now the browser performs a TCP IP three-way handshake with that resolved IP address. The wireless controller, in this case, it can be zone director, smart zone. It's going to intercept the request and it's going to present itself as the URL's web server. In a lot of worlds, this is a little sketchy at first because think of a spoofing attack. That's really kind of what this is mimicking. However, it's not malicious. Now, all of this transfer transpires seamlessly to the client. The client, the browser, it doesn't know that all of this is going on. As I mentioned earlier, this is really behavior that's that's very similar to a TCP Synax spoofing attempt, but it's not actually that. Again, it's not malicious. All right, at this point, the client's going to be redirected, and it's going to be redirected to a URL that's been configured within the venue's walled garden. They manage this. It will look different between different venues, but it should have some type of marketing and labeling on it. Walled gardens are not configured to redirect users to other websites. However, they are configured to allow users to reach URLs or websites outside of that walled garden. So for example, once you're in the walled garden, 
the venue may select to utilize an enrollment site like CloudPass so that once you go to any URL, the controller, whether it's Zone Director, or Smart Zone, or the access point. Now, remember, this is really going to heavily rely on what version's running. That's why release notes become really important. But that controller or access point will redirect the user to that site. That redirect is possible because the URL is allowed within the walled garden. All right, so as an example, let's show you what this redirect looks like. If you've ever messed around with Wireshark or seen packet captures, I'm sure you're familiar with this. But here we can see that we're getting an HTTP 302 move temporary location, and then it's going to just drop it back into an internal RFC 1918 IP address. Okay, sometimes the user is going to receive a certificate warning. This behavior is expected. I have seen people, most notably, probably one of my parents have seen this happen and said, oh no, what happened? But it's not a bad thing. The problem is, is that the fully qualified domain name in the certificate presented by the controller, it's not gonna match the URL that you attempted. So it's gonna think that something's wrong and something malicious is going on. But as long as you understand the venue that you're in and what you're doing, this shouldn't be cause for alarm. Now the browser is going to turn around, it's going to initiate an HTTP or an HTTPS get to the IP address of the controller. The URL that responds will present the user with an HTML form. This is where you're going to have to enter a username and a password. Sometimes the venue will provide you with those. Uh, other times they'll just give you a piece of paper that has the hotspot or the whisper SSID username and password on it. If payment information is required, it'll be included in that as well. So at that point, the user is going to complete and submit the form. And then the controller, such as Zone Director or Smart Zone, will then forward those credentials to the Radius server for authentication. Now, assuming that the user inputs the username and password correctly, they're going to be redirected to the requested URL. The controller that they're connected to or the controller that lives within this environment typically caches any URL that you've tried to attempt while trying to connect. Once all of this is completed and the URL displays that you attempted initially, you've been connected now and you've used Whisper in the background. So now you should have a pretty good understanding of how this process and function actually works and what's under the hood. Check the description box below for great resources located on the Ruckus support portal. There you can find KB articles, documentation, videos, and more. Thanks for watching.